Far out in the Pacific, under crushing pressure and eternal darkness, Japan claims it has struck something extraordinary. In the remote water surrounding Minamitorishima, deep within Japan's exclusive economic zone, surveys revealed a massive field of manganese nodules, 230 million tons in total, loaded with 610,000 tons of cobalt and 740,000 tons of nickel. Tokyo has a plan. Beginning in 2026, a government-backed pilot will attempt to pump up rare earth-rich mud or nodules from depths of 5,000 to 6,000 meters using deep sea risers and shipboard processing. If the experiment works, it could tilt the global battery supply chain. If it fails or is blocked by science and politics, the ocean might retain its secrets. Imagine you're flying over the Pacific. Far below, nearly 2,000 kilometers southeast of Tokyo, lies Minami Torishima, a tiny coral atoll. Uninhabited, but geopolitically powerful. Around it spreads Japan's exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, a maritime belt that gives Tokyo exclusive rights to exploit resources on and under the seabed within 200 nautical miles. That legal boundary is what turns this barren outcrop into a strategic frontier. Within this exclusive economic zone, scientists have uncovered something extraordinary. Two resource stories overlap here, manganese nodules and rare earth-rich mud, both at abyssal depths near 5,000 to 6,000 meters. First, the nodules. These are potato to fist sized concretions formed over millions of years. Layers of iron and manganese oxides precipitate around a nucleus, say a grain of sand or a microfossil, and gradually grow outward. Over vast flat plains where sedimentation is low, these nodules lie scattered, sometimes in dense carpets. In this region, a 2024 survey, 10,000 square kilometers, estimated a staggering 230 million tons of nodules containing around 610,000 tons of cobalt and 740,000 tons of nickel. The depths? Between 5,200 and 5,700 meters. But Japan doesn't just care about nodules. They're also after rare earth rich mud, fine silty sediment, enriched in essential REES like neodymium, dysprosium, gadolinium, terbium. That mud can't be scooped up like nodules. It must be pumped via riser pipes from the seabed up to the surface vessel for processing. So here's the trick. Nodules equals hard lumps on or above the seafloor. REE mud equals enriched sediment in and beneath the seabed. Both lie in the same strategic zone off Minami Torishima, but they demand different technologies, different engineering, and different risk profiles. When I say 230 million tons, that's nodules. When I refer to the 2026 pilot mining plan, that's REE mud extraction at similarly extreme depths. As we move on, I'll show how Tokyo intends to marshal tech to turn this deep sea zone into a new resource frontier. After we've placed the prize on the map, the question is, how did they actually find it? Let's back down to the deep sea. First, Japan's teams began with acoustic surveys. Using multi-beam echo sounders and side-scan sonar, they scanned large swaths of the seafloor for backscatter anomalies, areas where the seabed reflects sound in a way consistent with exposed rock or nodules rather than soft sediment. Those bright zones act like beacons pointing toward dense nodule fields. Then they narrowed in. Next came ground truthing. Over April-May 2024, vessels from Kiva Marine, Deep Reach, Nippon NUS sampled over 100 sites inside the EEZ. They deployed freefall grabs, box corers, and remotely operated vehicles ROVS to bring up nodule samples and sediment cores. In some cases, earlier expeditions, like the 2010 dives with RV Yokosuka and Shinkai 6500 had already collected nodules on the sea floor around 5,500 meters deep. These historical collections provided baseline chemical and physical profiles. Once samples came aboard, scientists measured metal content, cobalt, nickel, copper, and nodule density using geochemical labs and micro X-ray fluorescence mapping. 
They then use those point data to feed Krieging slash block modeling and high resolution geostatistics across the survey grid that produced maps of estimated nodule abundance in kilograms per square meter, thickness and metal grades. The result, a confident estimate of approximately 230 million tons of nodules across mapped zones with areas exceeding 30 kilograms per square meter in density. More than 60% of the surveyed patches showed densities above 20 kilograms per square meter. Transitioning out, that estimate is just the starting line. The real story comes in how they plan to extract it and whether the engineering can match the geology. Let's step into early 2026 when Japan plans to turn plans into action. This is where theory meets the deep sea. The pilot test begins in January 2026 in waters off Minami Torishima inside Japan's EEZ. The goal, to pump up rare earth rich mud from seabed depths of 5,000 to 6,000 meters and bring it on board for processing and analysis. Here's how it's supposed to happen. A specialized riser pipe connects the seabed to the vessel, forming a conduit to suck up sediment. On board, system separates sediment, water, and target minerals, concentrating rare earth elements, R-E-E-S, like neodymium, dysprosium, gadolinium, terbium. The data that emerge will tell engineers whether extraction is feasible on scale. In other words, can you reliably mine at abyssal depth? For context, the initial plan calls for recovering approximately 35 metric tons of mud over a few weeks. If that works, the next phase, January 2027, uh, would aim for a daily throughput of 350 metric tons. That kind of scale is critical if Japan wants to supply uh, our EES for high-tech industries. Midway through this trial, I'll ask you, do you think this pioneering effort will succeed or will the sea fight back? Yet risks loom at 5,000 to 6,000 meters depth. Pressure exceeds 500 to 600 atmospheres. The riser needs to resist collapse, ensure minimal leakages, and deal with density changes. Sediment clogs, pump failures, or unexpected chemistry could stall the operation. As we move to the economics and geopolitics, remember, this test isn't proof of profit, it's proof of concept. The question, can they scale it safely and sustainably? We've already mapped the prize, tracked how it was located, and glimpsed the upcoming test. Now it's time to talk money. Why would Japan or anyone gamble on mining under 5,000 meters rather than sticking to land? First, the demand is exploding. Electric vehicles, grid storage, and advanced electronics all depend on cobalt, nickel, manganese, and rare earths. These critical metals are already under stress. Terrestrial mines and refining networks are geographically concentrated and carry political risk. Deep sea deposits present a possible buffer. In Japan's EEZ near Minamitorishima, survey teams identified 230 million tons of manganese nodules containing about 610,000 tons of cobalt and 740,000 tons of nickel. That cobalt alone could potentially meet Japan's demand for decades. Yet that figure refers to nodules. The 2026 trial targets a different resource rare earth-rich mud, which requires pumping rather than collecting lumps. Of course, turning metal into profit is risky. The upfront cost is staggering. Building risers, collection vessels, separation systems, and processing infrastructure for extreme depths is uncharted territory. Operating costs compound the challenge, energy for pumps, equipment under immense pressure, wear and tear, blockages, and downtime all eat into margins. Supporters argue that with scale, millions of tons per year, economies could tilt the balance. But at pilot scale, unit costs will be sky high. Worse, if production scales, metal supply increases could depress cobalt and nickel prices, squeezing profitability. Success might undercut itself. Even if extraction succeeds, downstream challenges remain. Smelting, refining, and chemical separation are separate cost centers. Existing refineries are selective. They may not accept novel feedstock or may charge steep processing fees. And there is growing competition from battery chemistries that reduce or avoid cobalt entirely. 
In other words, the story here isn't just how much metal lies beneath the sea, it's whether the entire chain, from seabed to battery cell, can be built and operated profitably without breaking the bank. We've talked geology and economics. Now we turn to the power plays, how this seabed project levers Japan against China, shapes alliances, and strives for autonomy. To begin, China currently dominates the critical mineral stage that matters most, refining and processing. While it does not control all global reserves, Beijing captures over 90% of the global rare earth processing capacity. That means many nations, even ones with mines, depend on Chinese factories to turn raw ore into usable metals. In 2010, Beijing briefly cut rare earth exports to Japan amid a territorial dispute. That embargo, though short, exposed Tokyo's vulnerability. Let's imagine Japan succeeds with the 2026 trial. Suddenly Tokyo can credibly say it has an independent source of battery metals and rare earths. That reduces over-reliance on China. It strengthens Japan's hand in negotiations, partnerships, and trade. It also sends a signal to allies. Japan is willing to invest in resource sovereignty. Speaking of allies, this discovery positions Japan to deepen cooperation with the United States, Australia, India, and others. Joint procurement, shared processing facilities, and supply chain alliances can emerge. In fact, Tokyo is already exploring ways to align rare earth strategy with Washington to offset Chinese dominance. The mingled incentives of resource security and diplomatic leverage make Japan's seabed project more than science, it's statecraft. However, this road is uneven. Even if Japan mines and extracts metals, Chinese firms still control many elements downstream. Unless Japan or its allies build competitive refining capacity, they may still depend on Chinese processing. Some industry players note that Chinese firms actively court seabed mining projects to force cooperation. Also, risks include diplomatic backlash. Beijing could retaliate with export controls, tariffs, or economic pressure. Japan must manage relationships carefully to avoid sparking self-defeating trade wars. If Japan can thread this needle, Asserting autonomy without isolating itself, it could shift the balance in the Indo-Pacific. The seabed becomes not just mineral ground, but geopolitical ground. Let's move next to environmental risks and whether this vision can survive in reality. Now we shift focus underwater to the fragile ecosystems and staggering unknowns. What happens when humans stir up the abyss? Deep sea mining is not a gentle process. When collectors or pumps disturb sediments, they generate plumes, clouds of suspended particles, and dissolve metals. These plumes can drift beyond the immediate mining zone, smothering organisms, clogging filter feeders, and altering water chemistry. Some of the plume particles settle slowly, others travel hundreds of meters or more, impacting benthic and pelagic life alike. In some experimental tests, Plumes from prototype collectors showed turbidity currents hugging the seafloor, staying close but moving laterally. Over time, these disturbances persist. In one recent study revisiting a site mined decades ago, communities are still altered and have not fully recovered, even after 40 years. It gets more serious when we consider abyssal life itself. Many organisms in nodule fields depend on those nodules for substrate. Remove or bury the nodules and you erase habitat. Recovery in deep ocean environments is glacial. Species grow slowly. Reproduction is rare and recolonization may take centuries or more if it happens at all. Across the scientific community, debates rage. Some argue cautious mining may be possible with strong regulation and mitigation. Others counter that our knowledge is too limited to guarantee safety. Scientific gaps remain vast. We still lack baseline data for many deep sea ecosystems and models of plume dispersion and ecological resilience are only in early stages. One intriguing new factor is the discovery of dark oxygen, oxygen produced in abyssal seafloor zones without sunlight. If this is confirmed, mining could disrupt a hidden chemical process that supports previously unrecognized life. The bottom line is this, mining the deep sea risks far more than we currently understand. The plumes might ripple outward, species may vanish, and decades of recovery may not restore original states.
The stakes include ecosystems, biodiversity, and deep ocean integrity. Mining at 5,000 to 6,000 meters depth brings engineering nightmares few have faced before. The pressure weighs in at over 500 atmospheres. Every joint, every valve, every pump must resist collapse and leakage under intense stress. To build a functioning system, Japan must invest massive amounts of capital. Past studies suggest a deep sea mining project could demand 1.95 billion US dollars in capital expenditure and 9 billion US dollars in operating costs over its lifetime. Those numbers reflect specialized vessels, high strength risers, robotic collectors, and support infrastructure designed for extreme environments. Operating costs bite hard too. Pumps and pipes must run continuously, dealing with abrasive sediments, blockages, corrosion, and wear. Breakdowns in the deep sea are expensive and slow to repair. The risk of clogging or pressure failure could stop production entirely. One technical challenge is vortex-induced vibration VIV on riser pipes. Strong currents can cause pipes to oscillate, fatigue over time, and fail unless safety margins are huge. To counter that, engineers often overdesign parts, which drives costs further upward. Beyond mechanical risks, scale is uncertain. Early trials might lift tens of tons, but to make a dent in supply chains, operations must scale to millions of tons per year. Whether the architecture can grow reliably and safely is unproven. Finally, monitoring and control at full scale in remote dark depths is a challenge. Sensors, remote vehicles, real-time feedback all must operate flawlessly in a hostile environment. One misstep at those depths can cost tens of millions, or worse. If the scale or engineering fails, even a resource as vast as that off Minami Torishima may remain off-limits. As we arrive at the finish line, here's what matters. Japan's 2026 trial is more than a science experiment. It could chart a new course for critical minerals, sovereignty, and supply chains. If the test succeeds, Tokyo may reduce its dependence on foreign suppliers and gain strategic leverage in the Indo-Pacific. If it falters, the deep sea may remain off limits, and the risks may outweigh the rewards. The real story isn't just about one dive or one pump. It's about how nations balance ambition technology, and environmental caution in an age of resource scarcity. If you found this deep sea journey intriguing, hit the like button and subscribe. And now I want to hear from you. Do you think humanity should tap the ocean floor for minerals or protect it at all costs? Drop a comment down below.